Today's webinar features Colorado Lee Varis, who is the owner and founder of Varis Photo Media. He's a photo illustrator working in Hollywood. He's been involved in commercial photography for the last 35 years. His work's been featured on movie posters, uh, video box covers, CD covers, brochures, catalogs, magazine articles, you name it, he's been on it. Lee's creative imaging has been featured in National Geographic and Fortune magazines, as well as many other publications. His latest book is called Mastering Exposure in the Zone System for Digital Photographers. It's a complete guide to both technical and creative aspects of exposure in digital photography. And I urge you to also see his book, Skin, and sign up for the additional material he's making available in conjunction with that book at www.varis dot com slash skin book. Now please welcome our good friend X Right Colorado Lee Varis for his program called Fantastic Photo Illustration. Okay, so thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm going to go through a, a, a sort of a Halloween themed image uh, construction uh, today. And uh, but before I do that, I just wanted to share kind of my background, where I'm coming from. Uh, I've been a commercial photographer for 35 years, but I've actually been doing professional photography for 40 years. And 20 years of that time has been doing digital. So I kind of have one foot in both worlds, both old school uh, photography and, of course, the new wild, wild west of digital, uh, which I've been doing for 20 years. So I've grown up through that transition. Most of my uh, uh, commercial career has been involved in doing movie posters. Uh, for instance, this was one of my award-winning uh, posters. I did the moth for the Silence of the Lambs, the easiest job I ever had, but that's the one that uh, I won awards for and people remember. Um, any, at any rate, uh, I was also doing digital photography for movie posters. I, did, I was the first person to actually use a digital camera uh, that ended up on a movie poster. This uh, was a body double shoot. Uh, where somebody else besides Angelina Jolie was doing the repelling. It was for a, a big billboard, and I shot this on a 6 megapixel medium format camera back. And then uh, we kind of used the head uh, from a regular Hauselblad medium format film, uh, scanned it and stripped it in here. It's actually her head and her boobs. You know, we couldn't <laughs> we couldn't improve on the, the, the boobs with the body double. So um, they actually had to kind of soften the digital file and add noise to it to make it match the quality of the scanned film. So at, at this point, um, the studios realized that everything was going to be digital. I was the unofficial photographer for the Enterprise, and, and just about all of the movie posters where the ship appears, which is just about all of them, I shot the picture of the model of the ship. Uh, now, the last two movies um, kind of retired out of that <laughs> that arena, so I didn't get to uh, work on the, the last two movies, and they didn't use models, it was all CGI, so there you go. Uh, I also did some work for National Geographic here, this was an illustration for an article on the uh, information revolution, this is all one chimpanzee composited into the library, and of course they're all typing out Shakespeare on a prototype Apple computer that ended up being uh, you know, the prototype for the iMac. Um, anyway, um, I did a lot of uh, different image composites uh, because of my background in movie posters. I applied all those photo illustration techniques to my other work. And uh, we're going to work today on, um, dive right into Photoshop here. I'm going to create uh, this image, um, kind of a, a Halloween themed image, and we'll, we'll show how to do masking and compositing. And uh, but first, I wanted to talk a little bit about monitor profiling. Um, it's extremely important, and uh, I have to mention this because this is, after all, a an X Right sponsored webinar. And uh, I just invite you all to to, to look at this. And uh, I think most people would agree that we have a black square inside a white square inside of a gray square. And the longer you look at this, the more neutral this gray looks. And uh, as it turns out, humans are very bad at judging neutral uh, in highlight shadows or midtones. In fact, this isn't particularly neutral. If I turn that top layer off, you can see this one is neutral. 
and you may just be able to see if your monitor is calibrated well you may be able to see this white change it's uh it's actually a little blue if we look at the numbers uh it's higher in the blue channel so this, this is not a neutral white and that's certainly not a neutral gray and in fact this is not really black so you you wouldn't know that just by looking at this so that's why you need an actual hardware device to calibrate your monitor and get it into a consistent state so it's always showing you the same thing day in and day out. Uh, very, very crucial, and especially when we get into these you know, creative things where we're trying to make judgments on particular colors and how light or dark the shadows are. You really need to have a calibrated monitor. So enough of that. Uh, we're going to work on this image, but... Uh, first, I wanted to talk about a preference setting in Photoshop that I think is really critical for this kind of work. You know, right now I, I have a, an image layer with a layer mask, and we're looking at the layer transparency here. Um, now, this display of this checkerboard, which represents transparency, is a preference setting that can be changed. So if we go into Photoshop Preferences and look under here, under Transparency and Gamut, we have these preferences and, and you can you know you can change small you know whatever these these different uh, settings are the light medium dark uh, but you can also actually change the actual color of the of the the checkerboard if I what I like to do is I'll click on this this white the white square and I'll make it just a little bit darker to the point where it it's almost blending in um, with the other gray square so you don't have quite as much contrast and some people like to set it up to be exactly the same uh, I, I prefer to see just a little bit there uh, and uh, this shows you the reason why because when we can actually we don't have as much annoying contrast in that checkerboard you can see some detail in the edge and it's particularly important when we're trying to judge how well the mask is along a certain edge so go ahead and, and change that preference setting. Um, this is the preference setting that I use, just so you don't get confused looking at uh, my project as I build it up here. Uh, so I'm going to start over. I've got um, I've got a, a, a blank document here. It's 11 by 14. We're going to work on a slightly smaller size, uh, which is very common when you're comping up an image to get it approved. You don't necessarily want to work at full res. So we're working at, say, half res to make this little Halloween poster. And to save time, I've got my title treatment already placed in here. Uh, and my first chore is to mask this figure out. So um, I'm going to build a mask. Instead of working from the inside out and, and selecting the inside of the figure, since the background is so uh, even, it's an even tone, mostly even tone background, I'm going to go ahead and use the magic wand tool here. So I select the magic wand tool. I'm going to set my tolerance at 15. And uh, I'm going to click on the background to select the background. So I click and it, it reaches out and selects similar pixels. And when it bumps up against an edge or a different value, it stops. So we're going to shift click to add to the selection to make sure we get that whole background selected in this little area like that. And then to select the figure, we just inverse the selection. Go to Select Menu, Select Inverse, and there you go. So now we have the figure selected. And I can check the selection just to make sure uh, by going to the Quick Mask mode, this little icon down here, or hitting the Q key. And sometimes I do that just to make sure I don't have little pinholes in, in what will ultimately be ultimately become the layer mask. Um, but then once you have the marching ants and you have a selection tool handy, you'll notice in the tool options bar you have this little refine edge button. So we're going to click on that to build some detail into this edge. We, right now, um, you know, the hair edge is not particularly good. I actually don't care about the hair for this composite, but I'll proceed as if I did. Uh, so I can view the mask or the selection as a mask, either on white or sometimes I like to use this this overlay or you can view it on black, or you can just look at the mask by itself. Um, we'll, 
we'll use this for the time being. Um, and I'm going to actually set this up to detect the edge. So we're going to use edge detecting, detection, and I'm going to just put a radius in here. As soon as I let go of the slider, it's going to recalculate the, the mask edge. Um, I'll show the radius just so you can see. This is what's happening. It's, it's at, the, at the border of the selection. It's placing a little kind of radius edge. We can use smart radius, and it tries to expand the, the edge to look in more, um, more complex areas like around the hair. I can also just increase the size of the radius just by moving that slider. I can also remove things from uh, consideration. I see these little spots here. Um, if I hold down the option or alt key, my cursor changes from a plus to a minus, and I can just sort of paint those out so they're no longer considered as in, in the uh, calculation. And I can also paint into the edge to expand it, like around the hair here. I might want to try to get into a little bit more inside the hair edge there for the areas that, that might be transparent, or at least see through to the background. So I can manually edit how wide that edge detection is. And uh, we, now if we uncheck show radius, we see the effect of the recalculation, and now we see the hair has got a lot more transparency in it. Um, I'm going to edit this mask further manually, but for now I've got a, a pretty good mask. I'll just say OK. Uh, and now that I have uh, my edge refined, I'm going to uh, add the layer mask here. So I'll click on layer mask. I've done this before, so I'm holding on to this so I can uh, actually, um, I'm going to demonstrate editing this mask manually, but I'm not going to take the time to do the whole edge. Um, so now you can see that when I don't have that distracting checkerboard pattern, I can see little issues. You know, I've got a little bit of noise kind of happening on the outside there and a kind of a little dark line here that uh, I'd like to get rid of. So, but I, I don't want to mess with that amount of detail that's like in the hair edge. So I'm just going to do it manually. Uh, and the way I'm going to do that is we're going to first use the blur tool. I've got the layer mask selected. I'm just going to blur. I'll run the blur tool over that. You can kind of see over here. It's just sort of blurring uh, all the noise that's around the, the mask and uh, the edge of the mask. And then I'm going to take the burn tool and I'm burning shadows, a very high exposure value here, and I'm just going to burn into that edge. You can see what's happening. It creeps the edge in, sharpens it up, I've got uh, some, still some noise around here. Again, I'm going to cover up this head with a jack-o'-lantern, so I'm not, I'm not that worried about it. Um, let's look at another area. All of that I would do. I'd use the blur tool to take out that edge. Um, there's, there's a little bit of extra transparency along the edge here, so um, I can see an area where it's, I'm getting, I'm seeing, you know, it's like a little extra blurry on, on that inside. Um, so when it's when I'm seeing stuff on the inside, I'm going to first use the dodge tool to kind of dodge that area out. Okay, um, let me undo that. And let's look at it in the mask. Okay, so we'll look we'll look at it in the mask. Um, I'll solo the mask for you so you can see. Okay, that's what the mask looks like. And you can see there's little bits of noise and stuff along that edge. If I use the dodge tool, I will kind of lighten the gray parts along that edge. Then I follow up with the blur tool. It blurs the noise and blurs the edge. And then when I use the burn tool, it sharpens the edge up, but it does it by creeping you know, the, hot, the shadows into the highlights. So it eliminates the noise by burning it out and creeps the edge in. Okay, so and I would do that around the, all the edges, so you like right in here. 
Um, I just need to blur that edge and burn it back. Okay. But I don't want to do it everywhere because I want to preserve a little bit of that hairy legs, you know, that edge of the hair there. It's all the, the, the refined edge is giving me a nice kind of hairy edge here, and I want to preserve that. But in the places where aren't, that aren't hairy, I want to edit the edge of the mask, so I do it manually. Okay, I've already done this uh, uh, before, so I'm going to throw this layer away, and this one's already got a prepared mask. So we can just... Uh, now we're all ready to go. I'm going to drag it into my untitled document here. So I get the Move tool, and I click inside the window here and drag him up to that untitled document, and we'll just sort of drop him down in there. Um, now, just for visualization purposes, I'm going to get the skyline and put that in there behind him. So I'm going to drag that up and drop it in here. It's coming in above him. I'm going to put it right behind him. And we got to scale this one up. And I'm going to blur this. Uh, so I don't care that it's at low res now. I'm going to go ahead and hold down the Option and Shift key, and I can scale it from the center out and keep the aspect ratio the same. Um, so let's see. Let's get this positioned here, something like that. And ultimately, I'll be blurring that in a minute here. But let's work on the sizing of this figure. Now, this this is an important part of uh, the process here. I, my intention is to build a comp at a, about half res. So I'm going to scale him down to get him to fit the layout, but then if it gets approved, I'm going to want to scale him back up. So it'd be great if I could just scale the whole document up with all the layers in it, then I don't have to redo anything at higher res. So what I'd really like to do is be able to scale up using this larger or higher res version of this figure. So the trick to managing that is to convert this into a smart object. So if I go layer here, layer smart objects, convert to smart object, it kind of bakes the layer mask in there. But now, when I scale this down, it it's, preserves the original file that ha, that's larger and has more resolution. So let's see, let's scale it down here, get them to be about, about that size or so. And... Uh, Okay, so now it's a smart object. If I scale this up again, it's going to go back to the smart object and scale up from there rather than this smaller size version that I've already thrown away information on to get it to be smaller. Okay. Um, so let's, I'm going to hide this lower part of this figure with a shadow. So I'm going to make a layer to hold that. It's going to be a shadow. So I double click on the the name there to be able to edit the, the name of that layer. And I want this layer to be constrained by the transparency in this layer, the figure layer. So I want the, ladder, the shadow to apply over the figure, not over the background. So one of the shortcuts to do that is when you're moving your cursor over the, in between the two layers, if you hold down the Option or Alt key, you notice how that cursor changes. And when I click now, this layer is now in a sort of clipping group relationship with this layer. So this layer is constraining this layer. Um, and let's see how that works. Let me zoom out here. I'm going to paint a black shadow in there using a gradient. So I'll put black in the foreground and get my gradient tool, click inside the gradient, uh, or select a gradient preset here to edit it. So we'll se select this preset. Foreground to transparent. It's the second one over. And now I'll click and drag in this layer with the grain tool, starting work with black, and it will gradate to transparent. So I'm going to click and drag up. If I hold down the shift key, I can constrain this to a straight perpendicular line. And there's my shadow that gets them to kind of blend in with the horizon. Now um, I've already scaled this up to, to fit the layout. Uh, I'm going to run a filter on it. I'm going to run a blur filter to make it look like it's in the distance. And uh, usually when I'm running filters, just to kind of um, 
I'll keep my options open. I'll convert it to a smart object so that my filters are smart filters. So let's run a, a blur on that. And uh, you know, something like that. If 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 we decide to make it sharper later on, because it's now a smart filter, all I have to do is double click on that again and I'm right back where I left off. So I can make it sharper. If it, if, it, if it was a regular filter and I'd already applied it, I wouldn't be able to do this. I could make it blurrier by blurring on top of it, but I couldn't sharpen it up. So um, that's, the, that's the advantage of that uh, smart uh, object with smart filters. Okay, so the next thing I want to do, um, I'm going to make his fingers kind of into scary claws. Okay, so uh, for that, I'm going to use Liquify. And one of the new features of Photoshop uh, Creative Cloud is that Liquify will apply now to a smart object. It didn't used to, but now they've included Liquify as, as a smart filter. So I can apply Liquify to a smart object. And that has a number of advantages besides just being able to undo my work. Um, so I'm going to zoom in here. And what we're going to do is make... Uh, some sort of scary claw fingers. You know, I'm going to stretch these out. And the secret to using this forward warp tool here is to set the brush pressure really low. The default is at 50 or so. We want it down, you know, around 15 or so. Okay. And then you just kind of pull on it a little bit at a time. And I, I find that this gives you way more control than trying to do it at uh, a high brush pressure. It uh, eliminates the potential for image tearing if you try to go too fast with it. And, you know, it also, in this case, it helps me pull out a point, um, which I'm trying to do, get these fingers to look really scary. Pull this out here. Maybe curve it a little bit. So you can kind of see uh, by by doing it slowly, I think you have a lot more control. So we're getting some nice, scary-looking hands there. Let's go around here. Um, so I'm just kind of dragging it out, and then I can sort of curve the ends. It makes it really easy to do this. The brush pressure allows it to work faster, but you really want to be careful and not overdo it because um, if you try to do it too fast, you can kind of tear the image a bit. I've seen like little holes show up, you know. Okay, we're getting there. Uh, so the other thing to do here is to show the backdrop. If we click on that, you can kind of see where it was before we distorted it. So it gives you a point of reference. Um, but I'm good with this, so I'm just going to say OK. And after when it finishes calculating, there. Now I've got the scary fingers. Now the advantage to having this in the smart object is that the layer mask gets baked right into it. Uh, and so when I run the liquify, it it distorts both the mask and the fingers at the same time. Uh, before, you, you had to kind of do them separately, um, uh, which, you know, is easy enough to do, but it takes twice the time. So um, this, this, having this as, as a smart object has all these other advantages. Okay, so now we got that. We're going to, let me colorize this background. I'm going to add a, a hue saturation adjustment right above it here. And... We'll just do a hue rotation in the background to get it kind of in the blue, purple kind of color here. And now we're going to add the, uh, the jack-o'-lantern head. Okay. So I already made a mask here. Uh, and this mask was really easy to make. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it away and uh, we'll redo it. Um, Everything is kind of more chaotic tonally, so the, the magic wand won't work as well. But the quick select tool will work really nicely because we have a difference. We have a very discrete edge, and there's a 
difference in color between the subject and the background. So this this will work very easily. Just brush that quick select tool inside the object that you want to select and it will just kind of, when it finds an edge, it just stops. Uh, it's a little more sophisticated than the magic wand and so generally we get a nicer edge. I don't usually have to edit it too much. So I'm going to add the layer mask and then just zoom in just to inspect that edge just to make sure and I, I can see that the edge in the mask is a little aliased, so we're going to edit the mask using the mask properties, which you can use here in the properties panel, or just double click on the, the layer mask thumbnail, and you get the mask properties. And we're going to go to the mask edge again, uh, but this time instead of using edge detection, I don't need to detect the edge, I know where the edge is, I need to smooth it, so I'm going to use this adjust edge tools here. So I'm going to add a little smoothing. Uh, I can I, a, I can feather it, which blurs the edge. And then once you've done that, you can add contrast, which is kind of like globally sharpening up the edge. So I've smoothed it, feathered it. Now adding the contrast, I got a nice like smooth edge. Uh, I could also shift the edge if, if it was showing part of the background. It, it isn't. If I shift it minus, it would creep the edge in just a little bit. Um, so I just say OK, and that's another way of editing, sort of the globally editing the edge of the, of the mask. So we're good to go here. We're going to drag this into our untitled document. And he's now underneath everything. Let's bring him on top. And it's too big. Uh, and again, I'm going to convert this into a smart object so that when I go to scale this up after it's approved, I can just scale the whole document and I will preserve all the detail that uh, uh, is in this original resolution of this file. So we'll go now here. Oh, let's uh, do um, Command or Control T and we'll scale it down so that it looks like a head now instead of such a giant pumpkin. And we'll just drop it down there just about like that. And now what I want to do is create a, a drop shadow. So I need a layer underneath the jack-o'-lantern. I'll make a empty layer. I'll call this drop. Good idea to kind of name your layers as you go along because, you know, if I stop working on this and come back to it later, this helps me know what those layers are doing. So I'm going to get a brush tool, I'm just going to paint a, a kind of a drop shadow in here. And I usually start at 30% opacity. I'm just going to paint it in there. And I want a nice hard drop shadow, but maybe, maybe not cover up that little highlight that's coming from the rear. But there it is. Now you can see I've painted over into the background. Uh, I want this to only apply over to the figure, and that's why it needs to be in a clipping group. So I, again re reiterating if I hold down option or alt and click in between the two layers now it it is constrained by that figure layer and you can see that little shadow went away there so that's before it was in a clipping group and that's after see how that now just plays over the figure so these these clipping groups are really powerful and it, uh, I don't have to make additional layer masks and stuff okay uh, so now we're ready for our fire. Let's go get our fire. And uh, this is really easy to deal with because it's on a black background. So I, I'm, I'm going to do something different besides making a selection and a mask. Uh, we'll just drag this up onto my untitled document, drop it. It's got to be on top of the, the pumpkin. And now I want to see through all the areas that are black. And this is really easy. We're going to use blending options to do this. So I'll go to my layer channels flyaway menu here. And there it is, blending options. So we select blending options. And the fire is in this layer. We're going to use this, this blend if section here. And we're going to blend based on the, the luminosity in this layer. So I want to see through everything that's black. So I'm going to use this slider. I'll move it over. And you can see the black background's dropping away. But the transition now uh, in, in this fire layer is very abrupt. It's happening at, at a level of 20 pixels. So everything darker than 20 
uh, I'm seeing through. But I need the, this transition to be much softer. So there's a little trick there. Uh, if I hold down the Option or Alt, this is my little one keyboard shortcut I can remember is Option and Alt. Once I get past two keys, I'm sort of keyboard challenged. Uh, so I hold down Option or Alt, and I can pull that slider apart. You can notice over here how it's it's feathering that transition. So at 20 pixels, I see absolutely straight through. Between 20 and 42, I am gradually uh, sort of feathering off. So I, I make a very nice soft transition that way. Um, and now I'm ready to scale this down. I'm not going to bother to convert this into a smart object. Um, because it doesn't really have any resolution. When I scale it back up, we, we won't really notice it. So um, I'm going to do Command or Control T. Uh, let's uh, you know resize this down a little bit here, uh, and I want to get it so that it looks like the the fire is coming kind of out of the eyes. See how the fire licks are kind of coming in there. So not too bad. Make that like that. It's pretty convincing. Now we're we're ready for our clouds here. So uh, where there's fire, there should be smoke, and so I have these sort of smoky-looking clouds. I'm going to drag that up into my background, and uh, I want this part to be at the top. So I'm going to do a transform, flip vertical. Okay, we'll drop this now behind, let me close my info panel. We'll drop this down behind the figure. And Command or Control T, I'm going to scale it so that it fits. And OK, very good. I'm going to add a layer mask to it because I don't want this hard edge showing. I want it to be a smooth transition. So I'm going to add a white layer mask and we're going to use our friend the gradient tool. Uh, again, I'm painting from foreground to transparent into this layer mask. Start at the bottom, it's going to be fully black. Hold down the shift key so it, you know, if I don't hold it down the shift key I can drag it an angle, but I want it to be perfectly uh, straight. And so now I have that smooth transition. Uh, now let's colorize those clouds to match. I'm going to put a hue saturation adjustment in there and we'll just kind of... Now, you notice what's happening. It's colorizing the whole background. That's because I need this to be in a clipping group with just the clouds. So your little icon down here, which you can recognize, it's that same little icon. If I click on that, it forces this to act just on that cloud layer. So now I can kind of create just the right sort of shade of purple there. Um, and you know maybe even put a, a I can there's a shortcut to getting the adjustment to be um, grouped right away if we hold down the option or all and get the adjustment layer from the this little icon at the bottom of the layers panel I'll put curves in there and now I can have the option to say make the clipping mask right away okay so now I've got the curve and I can you know, put a little contrast in there a little more scary. And I want to put sort of a darker shadow behind uh, uh, behind the fire here. So I'm making another empty layer for shadow and nice soft edge brush. Oops. Um, get the brush tool and painting with low opacity. I'm just going to kind of work in a little bit more of a shadow back there so there's a little more contrast for the for the fire to be displayed against. And something that I didn't have time for in, in the first webinar, I want to put a little kind of halo around the figure. Okay, so uh, again I'm gonna I'm gonna make an empty layer here to hold that that halo and um, I want it to be in the same clipping group. 
so the the shortcut again to kind of force it to be in a clipping group when you create it is to hold down the option or alt and when you select a new layer get the new layer icon uh, options and we have you know use previous layer to create clipping mask so that gets that to be in that uh, same relationship this is going to be our edge glow we'll see what I'm going to do in a minute here and I'll change that apply mode to uh, we'll use uh, we'll use color dodge and what I'm going to do is I'm going to select kind of an orange color here from inside the the pumpkin now I want I want to create just an edge glow all the way around um, I'm going to load the the transparency or the mask for this smart object layer the figure layer I hold down that command or control key and you notice how the cursor changes again um, it looks like this little dotted line right so that means I can load this as a selection so I get my my edge like this now I can I can stroke this but what I want to do is, is I want to get a paintbrush to move along that edge and the only way to do that is with a path so we're going to make a path from the selection so I'm going to select a path uh, I can can make a work path here like this or I can just click on this little icon at the bottom and that will make a path okay so that's that's my path now and now I'm going to stroke and I want to set up a paintbrush so I'm gonna, the paintbrush is going to just work its way all the way around the edge um, by clicking on this little icon, which is to stroke the path. So it's going to stroke the path with the, the tool that I select. So I, I'm going to set this at 30% opacity and stroke the path. And now I've already got like a little bit of a kind of orange glow. I'm going to make the brush a little bit smaller and stroke it again so I get a little more intense kind of a glow okay and now the only thing I need to do is uh, is turn on my title which is right here and uh, that pretty much finishes my image so I've done a lot of very kind of sophisticated things in a short amount of time um, and uh, we will we'll break for questions in just a second I just wanted to kind of sort of end up with a little bit, bit of promo about uh, other resources that I have available for you here so uh, first of all of course my website uh, I have a blog that I make posts to monthly so do check out my website and I have a channel on YouTube where there's a bunch of uh, free uh, video tutorials you can follow me on Twitter to find out where my workshops and, and classes are all around the country um, and hopefully soon in Europe so anybody out there in Europe if you want me to come uh, do a presentation to you uh, please let me know uh, this is my latest book called Mastering Exposure in the Zone System for uh, Digital Photographers this is uh, also available on, on Amazon in, in a Kindle as well as a paper version and also uh, my bestseller skin the complete guide to digitally lighting photographing and retouching faces and bodies um, that's also available on Amazon I have a course up on udemy.com in the photo illustration in fact this Halloween uh, poster is part of that course it's those nine hours of video uh, tutorials uh, 15 different projects the Halloween project is one of them and you get all the source files and you can download the videos to uh, peruse at your uh, leisure normally it's ninety nine dollars for nine hours of video it's a pretty good deal uh, but I can give it to you today at a special discount uh, fifty percent off if you uh, use the this coupon code YouTube 50 just like that you type it in when you purchase the course and you'll get it for forty nine dollars instead of ninety nine dollars uh, I also have a course at uh, PPSOP or the picture perfect school of photography this is a Photoshop layers fundamentals course it goes over all of the things that kind of I showed today <clears throat> we have uh, it's a four-week course with assignments and students can uh, do the assignments using their own images and upload them and I provide a critique 
Um, it's very, uh, very valuable. They're, they're uh, uh, open for enrollment right now, so uh, do check that out. I also have a DVD available on Photoshop Cafe. Uh, they say that this is on sale here at $49.99, uh, but I've seen this for months now like this, so I don't think it's uh, going up anytime soon, but you never know, so if you're interested, uh, run over there and purchase that. Um, be sure and like me on Facebook, and uh, if you sign up for my email list, I'll send you a 30-page uh, PDF uh, tutorial on the Zone system for free. And I think that pretty much covers it for me, so uh, now we're, we're available for questions. Wow, Lee, that's amazing. Uh, there's, I mean, there's just so many amazing things that you have. Uh, in addition to these uh, couple of webinars that you've done for us, and we're just so grateful for it. It's uh, it's really interesting. One of the questions was asking you how to put the the orange around the uh, image of the man. So uh, so we've got that that one all taken <laughs> care of. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, another question here is: Are all the images that you're using the same resolution? Well, there are different pixel dimensions. I mean, the resolution is a, is a, a, a function of how large you're going to print it, you know, and how many pixels you have to work with. So, right now in this assembled composite, it's it's all the same resolution. It's at 300 pixels per inch because that's how I built the document. But um, you know, the sources come from different camera files that have different pixel dimensions, and I'm just kind of, you know, blending them all size-wise together so they make sense. Okay, so you when you bring them in, then they become part of that 300. Yeah, because I'm defining the document that way. Uh huh. It, uh, you know, it's the it's it's how many pixels you have that really counts. The resolution only tells you how big you're going to print it. Uh huh. So you know, uh, since 300 is sort of a standard for this sort of thing, and clients always ask for 300, whether they need it or not. <laughs> they're going to ask for 300 pixels per inch, but that only tells you half the equation. It's like I could give you a postage stamp that's 300 pixels per inch. Is that a high-res image? Well, it is for a postage stamp, but it's not. <laughs> it's not high-res for a poster. Gotcha. Right. So you need to know how big in inches, and and then how many pixels per inch in order to know you what you're dealing to paint with. with a, a stylus okay, than great. a bar of soap. So, <laughs> Now, when you started out making this image, you began, you set it up as an 8-bit image, and w one question we had from Al was, why not a 16-bit image? Oh, you know, I'm going to open that whole can of worms, but <laughs> I, I'm, not a, I'm not a big uh, advocate of 16-bit editing. I've, I've yet to see it actually have a serious impact. Um, if you think about it, your, your uh, display is 8 bits. The color cards that we all use are 8 bits. They don't really make any, you know, high bit depth color cards anymore. They used to, um, but the display itself it can really only show you 8 bit precision. So, if you're working in 6 bits, 16 bits, you you're not really seeing 16 bits on the screen. So you don't have 16 bits of precision to make decisions about. Your interface also is not 16 bits. Um, so if I put a curve on, let's say I wanted to brighten up the figure, so I'll put a little curve adjustment on here. The curve adjustment, you know, if I put a little point on there and I move it one tick, that is one tick in 8 bits. It's the same movement in 16 bits. It's You can't get a finer granularity in your interface than 8 bits just because of the way it's Photoshop set up. So, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why it doesn't really make that big a difference. And uh, I, I've tested this, and I really can't see that it's worth it. I will say, though, there are a few things where internal calculations, if you're relying on internal calculations, in some instances, if it's in 16 bits, you'll get a better result. And one example would be uh, if you're stitching panoramas and you have, like, a lot of clear blue sky and you've got a subtle gradient in the sky naturally when you stitch the things together if you're working from 16-bit sources the blend between the stitching ends up being a little smoother in 16 bits that and that's that's really 
so in a lot of cases that's even hard to see the difference um, but for layer masks and and this kind of stuff the, the layer masks in Photoshop really are only 8-bit precise even though they in 16 bits they take up 16 bits of space um, the uh, you know refine edge dialog it works the same way in 8 bits and 16 bits I don't see any difference at all in the way it calculates so you know um, I'm sure there are plenty of people out there and if Jeff Jeff Shuey heard, heard this he'd be you know <laughs> to the woodshed and he'd be duking it out you know so you know, if you're happy working in 16 bits by all means Don, don't let me convince you otherwise I just think you're 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 pushing too much data around for no good reason well, there you go. Everybody's entitled to an opinion on that. Uh, now, this is kind of a technical question. Uh, it, it's, it came early in the in the program, uh, and it, it references the frequency separation technique that you that you showed. Um, and the uh, question that was in, the, in the last seminar, uh, yeah, the last webinar, we didn't do that this time. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I apologize. Then, but here's the <laughs> here's the question. Okay. Um, do the settings you use apply for both 8 and 16? The, quest, the person who asked the question, I apologize, I don't have the name right in front of me, said that they had heard someone else say, set it for 2 for 8-bit and 0 for 16. Do you have an opinion on that? Uh, well, I would say try it and see. Um, the, here's a question from Miles. He says, does your philosophy on the zone system relating to digital differ from the classic Ansel Adams zone system? That's a loaded question, I know. Boy, that, <laughs> that, and there's a long, long, drawn-out answer. Um, uh, the short answer is, is yes. I mean, the classic zone system was developed as a way of controlling the tones uh, in exposure and in your sort of developing process. So you were doing things like, you know, an N plus one developing. Right to shift the yeah. to shift the zone one zone higher. Well, you know the zones in Photoshop. It's like they're so completely plastic. You can put those zones wherever you want, very simply. You don't you know, and you have much more control over it. So it's almost you know not necessary to test for a n plus one development. We don't even do that. You know, we raw processes and stuff. But it's useful still to think about the image in terms of how it breaks down into zones. And it's useful to determine your sort of end points. So I like to say the zone one and the zone nine. Uh, you find out where those are with your exposure. Because if you, you don't want to go below that, you know, below a zone one or above a zone nine, on any particular area in the image, and if you can stay within those two extremes, you can put the zones almost anywhere you want. You know, the zones between those two extremes. So, um, yeah. Well, I think I think the important part is that with digital, you know, that we, for for a while, we got into this thing where we kind of had this idea in the industry that, oh well, you can fix it in Photoshop or whatever. But that exposure is still incredibly important yeah, in digital, yeah. isn't it? Yes, definitely. So, uh, you know, the goal is to try and get the exposure right. And the only way to really know uh, is to test. So in my book, a lot of the book is devoted to this sort of testing procedure for, you know, how you determine what your actual dynamic range is, what's your usable dynamic range, and, you know, um, and uh, what your actual ISO is, which is going to be, as it turns out, be a little bit different depending on the color temperature of the light that you're using. So um, that's quite a revelation. Once you do the test, you realize that, gee, the camera meter responds differently under tungsten than it does <laughs> under open shade. You know, even though they don't make any correction for it internally in the camera, you if you if you know that, you can make the correction. You can, you know, give it plus two thirds, you know, exposure in, in tungsten light, for instance, and you know, be a little more accurate. Uh, so uh, this is the goes back to question we had in the last webinar, and I know that you talked about 16-bit versus 8-bit, and I know that you said that you generally favor 8-bit and don't see uh, a lot of difference in them. But you you uh, you mentioned one specific situation where there might be a little difference. Would you talk yeah. a little bit about that? You know, there the the differences. Uh, <laughs> Mostly the advantage of 16-bit happens in, in, in these sort of internal uh, calculations. So anytime that 
you need to do some sort of calculations of one set of pixels against another, uh, that that extra amount of data can sometimes be a benefit. Um, fortunately, in, internally in Photoshop, whenever you do like a, a, a profile change, if we if we convert from one profile to the other, uh, all of those conversions are actually happening internally in 16 bits or high bit. So um, you know you don't have to worry about that so much, uh, if, even if you're working in eight bits. The one instance that you're re referring to, I mentioned this in the first webinar, if you are doing a panel. Of stitching a panel of multiple shots, and if that panorama it has large expanse of sky, where you've got a, a kind of a smooth, subtle gradient, you know, it's a little lighter at the top, a little darker at the bottom, or other, other way around, depending. Um, when you stitch it together, because it, it's that subtlety of the gradient that can kind of that really kind of matters in the panel, and you can see artifacts where the edges kind of come together. If you do that in 16 bits, it, it sometimes is a little bit smoother than if you, they were all 8-bit files. Um, but that's the only place where I really see any kind of visible difference. Um, and really, you know, the Photoshop interface is an 8-bit interface. It has 8-bit granularity. If I put a curve on something, I can only move it, uh, you know, the same kind of mount whether it's an 8-bit or 16-bit. I can't move it in a finer increment just because it's in 16-bit. Um, so that's, you know, you, you will give up a lot of the advantage of the extra, you know, fineness of levels in your 16-bit file because the interface can't even address it. Uh -huh. So, um, and we can't see 16 bits on the screen. Yeah. I, I mean, unless you have a $10,000 monitor system, you're looking at 8 bits no matter whether you're in 16 or 8. So I like to know what I'm looking at. If I see banding, I like to know that it's real banding and then I can fix it. Mm -hmm. You could be in 16 bits, see banding and it's, you don't know whether it's real or it's just part of the monitor. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's the point of fixing it, right? And then you find out, oh yeah, it was real after yeah. you've made an expensive print. So you know, really um, it, the thing that 16 bits is supposed to help you with turns out it's <laughs> most of the time it really doesn't matter at, at all, and um, I, I've just never really seen it from my own work to be a particular advantage. Now you spoke about uh, in uh, in the Creative Cloud in the CC version of uh, of Photoshop uh, with the smart the smart filters can be used on smart objects, right? Yes. And not in CS6, is that correct? Well, they've, they've always had smart filters, but some of the filters, notably, notably this Liquify. Oh, Liquify uh, particularly. You okay. never were able to run Liquify on a smart object, which is a big shame because, you know, Liquify is one of those funky, complex sort of filters that if you decide you need to revise it, you know, if you don't have it as a smart object, you have to start over again. You know, the smart object allows me to just, you know, kind of double click on that and get right in there. And I can, you know, I can change, oops, can change something. If I wanted to, I could make a change and I, I don't have to redo it. You know, it, it just updates and, you know, um, so this is, so the, this is a huge thing. I mean, that yeah. uh, for me anyway, because I use Liquify a lot. So the question, the general question was, if if a user is using CS6, yes. you know, can you sort of can you are there other things that you can think of that uh, Creative Cloud has uh, is an advantage over CS6 at this time besides that particular one? Um, there are some some modest little improvements, little little uh, refinements. Uh, uh, most of them are kind of under the hood. So they're not things that you you really see in the in, a, in the interface. This this uh, you know the CC upgrade is not like a big feature upgrade. Uh, it's it's getting us into the cloud and uh, there's a, there's some nice things with it. It's not doesn't have a huge number of like like what I call demo features. You know where you can say oh this is the reason to upgrade. Uh, I think we're gonna what what's going to be happening though because of the way the cloud delivery now is they give you new features right away whenever they become available so they don't have to wait for an 18-month 
product oh. every cycle. So they just oh. came out with something that was really useful for web designers that uh, you know where you can you can uh, it's that generate thing. So if I remember where that is, under where is it? Because um, I'm not a web designer. Here it is. Generate. So this this is a uh, is something that is huge for web designers because it will generate all the individual image assets for a web page based on the name that you give them in the layer. Oh, so wow. it, as long as you put, you know, like dot JPG, it'll take that layer and generate that image ad set as a, as a JPEG at the right size. So a lot of uh, web designers work in Photoshop as their comping method to kind of make the, whatever they're going to do the, on the page. But then they have to generate the assets and get them to load in and, and become an HTML document. And this this generate feature kind of automates that. And that just came in and like two updates ago. Well, you know they've well, had that, that really several updates in in Photoshop. So we're going to see continual uh, little updates and upgrades and, and little features added throughout the year instead of waiting, you know, for you know a year and a half or so. Really changes the game and how we think about updates and new features, really, doesn't it? Yes, and it makes the beta cycle <laughs> kind of more complicated because yeah. there's a continuous beta cycle now for the testers, and it's also a little more complicated for the third-party support because you know when you're re releasing these features, you never know if it's going to disable your particular plugin that you know if you worked all year on, and <laughs> you know then the next month an upgrade comes up, and you know so we're, it's there's going to be an adjustment period here, but I think all in all it's it's a good thing. Now I've got a one inch. Well, I'm going to get you to uh, to talk about your um, your your control panels, your menus, your custom oh, yes. uh, menus there at the end. But here's an interesting question I want to, I want you to address. I'm not sure I even understand it, so I'm just going to ask it. Do you find that luminosity masks can give tonal selections like the zones in the zone system? Um, there's a lot of things you can do with luminosity masks. Um, you could certainly use that uh, principle to isolate particular zones if you wanted. Um, there used to be some software, I don't know if it's still available, that that kind of did stuff like that. It broke the image up into zones. Um, you know, I think zones is, is a sort of an intellectual concept more than anything else. I mean, there, there are, I can look at this image and say that there are certain zones in it, but it's really a continuous play of very subtle highlights and shadows. So there's lots of things, tones in here that fall between zones. Breaking it up into ten zones, um, although it may be somewhat useful conceptually, uh, operating on individual zones is really not, you know, it's not that useful. So um, I think of the you know, luminosity masks, you can do all kinds of things with them, um, but I don't necessarily think of them in terms of, of zone system zones. So it might be of use as a teaching tool, but not necessarily something you practically use. Well, I certainly use luminosity masking all the time. Luminosity blending, mm -hmm. I mean, there's all kinds of things uh, that you can do. Um, no, I mean as, as it relates to the zone system itself. As it relates to the zone system, again, you know, like really for me, the, the zone system is the testing to determine what the ISO, the true ISO is of your camera. Right. And finding your zone one and zone ten, you know the, right. the zones in the middle. You know your your exposure is placing that zone five, uh, at at zone five. But you also want to know, like, if you need to have shadow detail, how far underexposed from zone five do you can you be to hit zone one? Mm -hmm. And you have to test to find that out, right? Because you know, the cameras and they're getting better and better every year. Yeah. You know, they're having greater and greater dynamic range, so you know we're finding more. You know you can you can underexpose more before you fall off the cliff and end up with you know black. Yeah. And it's kind of the same thing on the highlight side. So you do have to test to figure what it out is what it, what it is for your specific camera. But as far as the placement of zones, I mean, like I don't I don't think about placing zone you know skin on zone six. Right. You know, it doesn't I can make it any shade of gray I want. I mean, I, you know, because Photoshop is just so much more powerful than our old film-based tools were. Right. 
All right, now I want you to show them how you get your cool toolbars and how you get them okay, moved the over there bar. together. Yeah. You know, first of all, you know, oops, let me let me let me back up here. Uh, so we'll go to our essentials, and the, so this is the default layout, right? Uh, the first thing I do is I'm I'm right-handed, so the default layout actually is this, right? You always see this on on this side. And I don't know why Adobe decided that's the default. If you're right-handed, I think all your tools should be on the right-hand side. So you don't have to cross over the image every time to get a tool. So I'm, I'm mostly my hand is naturally over in this area, and so I, you know, grab the tools that way. Uh, if I was left-handed, I would flip this around, put all my panels over here, and you can just do that by dragging them. You know, they're, they're meant to be dragged. The trick is to drag it in this little kind of hashed area. Uh, not at the window bar, which will drag that whole thing now that they're locked together. Uh, then, you know, getting the other things inside here, it's just a matter of selecting the, the ones that you that you use, and, you know, they will populate that, uh, they'll populate that uh, panel uh, just by selecting them, right? So let's see, notes maybe, I don't, you know, I mean, I, I just like to put everything in there. And then I also have some custom extensions that give me a little extra panels there. And then you then you, once you've done that, you just save, you know, you, you save a new workspace right here, a new workspace. So I've already done that, and I'm going to select my, my workspace here. I think it's cool. I love that. I love that feature. Well, Lee, uh, we're right out of time, and uh, we thank you so much again for coming to do webinars with us today. Uh, just a great job, lots of great comments from everyone who attended both sessions. Uh, so thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you. My pleasure. All right. So you and folks Happy Halloween, know, everybody. That's right. Ooh, <laughs> that's a creepy, creepy image. All right, folks, we hope to see you at another x right Photo webinar very soon. Be sure to check out all those... Uh, specials that Lee has for you and we'll have this webinar up archived for you in just a couple of days. Thanks again. Have a great day everyone. Bye-bye.